Pushkin. Madeleine Peru is a jazz-inspired singer-songwriter who got her start singing in street bands in Paris as a teenager. In 1996, Atlantic Records released Madeline's debut album where she covered tunes from the 30s and 40s by artists like Bessie Smith and Billie Holiday. And then later, she recorded songs by Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen. This year, Madeline Peru released Let's Walk, her first album of all original songs co-written with her longtime touring guitar player, John Harrington. On today's episode, Madeline and John play through some songs for the new album, and Bruce Hedlund talks with them about their mutual creative process. Madeline also remembers her early days busking with a bohemian expat named Dan William Fitzgerald, who became her musical mentor. And she explains how Dr. Cornell West became her guiding light during a recent bout of personal despair. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Just a quick note here. You can listen to all of the music mentioned in this episode on our playlist, which you can find a link to in the show notes. For licensing reasons, each time a song is referenced in this episode, you'll hear this sound effect. All right, enjoy the episode. Here's Bruce Hedlum's conversation with Madeline Peru and John Harrington. You've got this new album, Let's Walk, which is very exciting. It's been, what, six or seven years, I think? Yeah. Since your last album. Now, your last album, at the time you said the question sort of driving that album was, where do you stand? What was the question going into this album? What was animating you going into the studio this time? These songs are essential to my experience in the middle of COVID, facing issues, realities, or feeling the need to be able to really get personal and, 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 you know, I've always tried to say, and I thought I sounded flip, flippant in the past when I said, Paul, everything is a little bit political. And some people would say, no, well, not, not everything. We need, we need to be able to get away from it. And I'm like, yeah, of course we do. You know, I, I was not ever civically engaged uh, in my life to a degree. So I, I suppose I was telling myself that the act of you know, playing live music, the act of of uh, sharing space, sharing vibrations in music is, at least when I was a street musician, it, it felt political <laughs> in a way. <laughs> but this time in 2020 that I was, I spent a lot of time forced to be alone with myself. And I would have gone mad if it hadn't been for John Harrington responding to my email saying, okay, that's an interesting idea. How about this? Uh, and we started collaborating. Mm -hmm. I think it was 2020 or maybe 2021 when we first started. Could be uh, 21, I'm not throwing sure. Throwing things yeah. back and now, forth. How did you know each other before then? Well, we, we've we been playing music together. I pay him to hang out with me. <laughs> I've, <Right>. been, <laughs> I've been working, working for Maddie for... Uh, at least 15 years. We think maybe yeah. more like 17 years. Okay, well, that's right. why I thought. I was a little so, surprised yeah. Just when in her band on the road. Yeah. When I reached. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So the right. relationship was a little different then is what you were. Well, this is new for us. Yeah. To, yes. To, to be songwriters, uh, especially writing all 10 tunes on the record, that that was new for okay for me and yeah. with Maddie. And yeah, no. I thought you'd been Maddie, around for a while. So I was... I think it was uh, new for Maddie, too. She's, she's yeah. had some you know records where there have been other authors, but never like an exclusive writing pair for all of the tunes, I don't think. That's true. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. And, and your producer, when he heard the song, said no covers. Yes, he did. We had a lunch, <laughs> one meeting with Elliot Shiner, and the, th the three of us sat there, and I, I had put together a list that that I thought, this will make sense, and we can revamp some older stuff, and, and let's then we'll get this record done sooner. And Elliot... He said, you know, I like the songs that you two wrote together. And so just do that. Only songs by you. Yeah, he said, he said no covers and, and none of those other songs, just the ones that you wrote with John. And, and, and if there aren't enough, write some more. You know? Is that <laughs> so, right? Yeah, that's what he said. I looked at John and I just went, <laughs> what the? How what we, are we going to do? Yeah, how are we going to do that? Well, you, you've been writing for a long time, but you kind of made your bones as an interpreter of... Tom Waits, Leonard Cohen, uh, one of my favorites, Joe Henry, 
uh, so what was it like to to say, okay, I, I'm ripping off that band aid. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was excited to try it, but I remember thinking, oh God, you know, what have we gotten ourselves into now? Yeah, it felt yeah. it felt daunting and overwhelming. I think at first, looking back at it now, I mean. It was it was a brilliant idea, I think, and uh, it made this record. And what I think it is, the record yeah. coheres as a, in spite of the sort of range of uh, you know sort of heavy to light you know sort of content mm-hmm. you know and and different moods. It it somehow coheres, which which I was concerned about, but glad to find that it that it does. I don't think it coheres know. in the traditional way at all. <laughs> I don't think it really. I think it's really weird. Record. I remember when well, we were recording it, sitting it. in the in the too, booth, but... going, "What are we doing? <laughs> this stuff is crazy." But, but it is. I... It just wanted it to let it be. I feel for me, these songs just came to us in varying degrees. We worked at chiseling away at them, but it's all a gift. And the the real mandate for me was to make sure that it's something that I really care about. <laughs> Even the mosquito well, song yeah, was, was something gonna, I really care about. <laughs> I was going to say that there are ways that it coheres for me, and that's that's the one I think that's the most critical, that these are the most personal collection of songs, I think, that you've ever put on a single record together, you know? And that's that's a big part of it. But I think sonically, thanks to Elliot, it coheres, and thanks to the musicians being all basically the same, same team, pe- mm-hmm. guys who had been on the road with you and everybody yeah. who was in the studio together. That's a, true. A background yeah. vocal section that was the same on the, f- the what four or five songs that have backgrounds. Think, yeah, you know? I don't know. And so, sonically, I think it holds up that way too. And I think mostly because you you weren't going to put a lyric on a, you know a word on this record that you hadn't vetted very thoroughly and f- and that didn't ring true to you personally. And and that's that coheres to me in spite of the range of styles, which which I understand is. Feels yeah, that's what I'm talking sometimes. about. Yeah. You know, just but, like. But there are other to, ways to look. at I don't it. think that other that a lot of producers would have let us get away with doing it like that. I think Elliot might be one of the few people that's truly still very adventurous. He's wide in his open. Spirit, yeah, that's a beautiful you know? thing. Yeah, I love that about him. Do you think another producer might have said, "Okay, but let's put on a let's put on a Leonard Cohen. Let's put on." Or well, downtown train. Let's put on something. No, I that... think that they would have wanted to rearrange the songs to be more tame in their stylistic breadth, mm-hmm. and and say, well, let's let's try to rein this into sort of a little bit dumbed down to be, you know, in a way, a little. Or bit maybe simplified. A, a, the songs musically are more similar than they are, you know far ranging but you know the other thing is another producer if he were were functioning as a real producer and wanting the clout and the control i mean we should uh, remind ourselves that you and i and elliot were all sharing the producer role and and for that reason i think elliot was hanging back a little more than yeah a, a, a sort of producer producer who was the only producer on the record would do and so it was a collaborative effort that way as well. And I think, you know, he liked that and wanted it that way. And he's a kind of reticent guy until it's important to speak up and then he speaks up. I know. Up. And that's, yeah. that, that's, that's how I remember it. That was kind of one him, of the only things he said great. at that lunch was no covers. <laughs> like yeah, said. no, it's, he, he's, <laughs> he's got, you know, strength, but, but he, he waits a long time and he only speaks up when it, when he knows it's yeah, important. Yeah, in fact, he's <laughs> sitting right here and he hasn't said a word. No, he's not. <laughs> No. Well, we're waiting for that. He'll he'll finish the episode. Um, so, how did you split up the producing duties? How did that work? Well, John did most of the work, right? <laughs> no. Well, pr- um, producing is a funny term. I don't and, know. And, and there's yeah. so many. There's so much overlap nowadays in the way most people put a record together. There, there's overlap b- between the songwriting, the arranging, the producing, the, yeah. the re- engineering, the recording. You know. So, John, you had made demos, right? Before we met with Elliot Shiner. And we had made demos too. And then I had added my vocals to them, but I think you pretty much were the one that made those demos. Yeah, pretty much. You played everything. We recorded anything that I recorded. I came over to your place. And some we didn't have time to really demo, but we we went for it anyway. Yeah, and then there was the one, like the title track, which you made the whole song. Yeah, that... that, And made a demo of it. So we could hear... 
all these vocal parts, all the harmonies, the type of bass treatment, the type yeah. of treatment, and the the energy. And some of these songs were, I mean, could have just been scripted. Obviously, we didn't do that to the guys yeah, when they, they no, got they were, in there. They were pretty mm -hmm. well thought out before we got to the That's studio. That's what I and, and, and that we wanted that was it John. to be that way. The title track, a couple tracks have a, they've got like a New Orleans feel to them. That one certainly does. Yeah, yeah. You've got that kind of New Orleans organ in a couple other songs. Was that deliberate? Was that did that come from something or? I think "Let's Walk" became a sort of the drummer was playing that kind of beat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah, it was we didn't, an organ I didn't conceive thing. of it that way, really. But, uh, but I think I changed it a little we, bit. Yeah. We tried it like that in rehearsal, and we 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 sort of liked that it felt a little more spirited and not so sort of safe. Or I something, mean, it's you know? a march, and yeah. what is more appropriate to feeling like you're dancing while you're walking, you know, feeling music and walking, that's American. Mm -hmm. What's more American than... Yeah, and I think the New Orleans thing... Than New Orleans it's, marches. It's a, natural, it's a natural part of all of these musicians, you know, sort of repertoire, you know, in terms of styles, you know, because it's music we always, we've all loved so much for so long, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's at the heart of you know, I mean, what do you think? Music, because, you know, so. like, to me, I'm... I have decided that American music is one of the main important things that we have to offer the world. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know what we have. We don't necessarily recognize it very well. We don't understand stylistically how much crossover there is, how much, like, how blurry that is, and yet how also steeped really in different, like, cultures that are identities mm -hmm. it is at the same time you don't think people say, i'm more country and i'm more bluegrass and i'm more ju people still do that which is so odd because there is no those things were never separate mm -hmm. in musically speaking well you know anytime the money gets involved you know the, the, the uh, categorizations help sell it so so that's why they're yeah but i'm genres, trying to yeah. i'm trying to step even further back you know now, most people, of course, think you're French. Right. You are American. Right. But you did live in France, and that was your kind of musical education. Do you think you have got that kind of outsider's view of American culture? Does that help? It helps immensely. There's several things about it. There's being American in another country and realizing and t listening to people talk about du terre and, uh, <laughs> you know, cool and the gong. And like, who's cool and the gong? And who are the Beatles? Who's, what is that? I've never heard of that band before. Oh, the Beatles? Oh, mm. okay, okay. So like, just like realizing what people talk about, how people talk about America, kids that were my age at the time when I was 12, 13 or older, you know. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, what happened when I became a teenager is I met American expatriates who I would have never met. That's something that Dan Fitzgerald said. He was from Kingston, New York, so upstate New York, but he used to hang out in the Bowery, and I used to take the train over to Canal Street over and Broadway. I would have been in New York City at the same time as him, but I was a young, like maybe adolescent or teenage white girl from South Brooklyn, and he would have been a middle-aged black man from Kingston, we would have never spoken to each other, even though we might have had all of these cultural affinities that were hard to find. But because we saw each other in Paris, we became, you know, like family eventually. And um, of course, it changed my life to be there because of that. So it was interesting. It's one thing to to try to, it's very hard to try to understand another culture. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I lived in France for a long time. My mother has lived there ever since 1987. She's still learning and we're, we're still talking about attitudes and different types of like sayings that you might have to describe something. And like just today, she said there's a French saying, women talk about French men, they say, you know, they're only interested until they have killed the beast. <laughs> which means, which wow. like, that's the, the literal translation of they catch you. 
Mm-hmm. The woman, a woman is the wildness has to be beaten out of you. You have to be tamed. I think is what it's kind of saying. And then they're, then then they're interested and they'll move on to other things. Mm. But well, uh, I'll try. I'll try that on my wife. <laughs> I don't. I don't suggest I, it. Yeah, is she American? I, <laughs> she's American. I'm not an American. She is an American, and I don't. I don't. I don't think I would survive that conversation. <laughs> I think there would be some killing, but it wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't be her. Um, so, but we should back up because Sorry. we haven't talked about Dan. There's a song about him on this record. Can you just back up and explain how you met him in Paris and and who he is, who okay. he was? Daniel William Fitzgerald was born in 1933 in Kingston, New York. Dan went to ministry school. He went to law school. He became disillusioned by both of those things, joined the army in the 50s, and that's what brought him over to Europe. And then he just started going back and forth and creating his life. And apparently in 1978, he was hanging out with some friends, some American friends he had met, expatriates in Paris find each other, right? And he said, I want to go to Jazz Fest this year in New Orleans. And let's start a band in order to go down there. Somehow he knew all these old Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey songs. He knew them by heart. And there's a Ma Rainey song called The Lost and Wandering Blues. And he started a band called The Lost, Wandering Blues and Jazz Band. He made a wash tub. He turned it into a wash tub base. He painted it. And he started this band. They went around from that time on. They went to Europe. And if there was an American who was going to wander around Paris and they bumped into him, they would bump into him on the street and they'd recognize him and then he'd make friends and we'd stay at somebody's house that night. We'd go play near a restaurant. The restaurant would come out and say, come inside and have a meal. You can hang out with us. And it was uh, it was a lifestyle that he created I come along to Paris uh, about 20 years later, 89, 90. I was about 15. (laughs) I joined a different street band that was in the same scene. At this point, you played ukulele or guitar, or what did you? I had a guitar, but I couldn't play any of the songs that we were singing. You know, people said, oh, what songs do you want to sing? I, I, I said, well, first I was ha- passing the hat for somebody, and I, and then I heard these guys singing, and I said, you know, I could probably do better than them. So I inv- <laughs> volunteered myself as a singer, and they were like, oh, she wants to sing a song? Okay, sure, what do you know? And so it was Georgia um, and Summertime, and that's it. And then I thought, well, I know all these other songs, but I couldn't. And you know, your, your mother taught you songs? Is that how? how uh, yeah, so? she, we, we used to play ukuleles together and she sang all the time she sang every morning she sang all over the house and and it was really the only time that my father was not being kind of a tyrant was when we would sit down the two of us and sing together he would just stop and (laughs) be quiet and listen and say oh i guess i can't i can't do anything better than that but the rest of the time he was telling us what to do but he was gone by the time you were in Paris. Is that right? Yeah, we moved to Paris right mm-hmm. after they divorced. He moved out. He was living somewhere in the city for the rest of his life, somewhere in New York. Eventually, he moved out to Corona, Queens in the end. Yeah. What, what made you want to start busking? The first thing that I remember was that I was, because I was in France and I couldn't speak the language and I wanted to make friends, I would go around, I would wander around the neighborhood with my guitar and just sit around and, and play while other people were talking to each other, kids. Mm-hmm. And one day somebody threw some money in, in the case. And I remember going, wait, what just happened here? So that was the revelation for me. It was like, oh, wait, you think I could actually make money doing this? This mm. would be amazing. And then I, I did wander into Paris. I saw street, I, I somehow we, we saw street musicians at one point. And I remember thinking, I've got to go back here to find these people. And I did, I did a, I did a like a trek through the city, trying to find them. And that's when I saw Danny's band. And I didn't speak to him that day, but I, it was absolutely memorable because they all had hats on, they had microphones and amps, and it was so weird. 
it was a weird type of hybrid of American music. Like it brings kind of full circle to what we were talking about because he had this sort of black American musical culture that I had never heard. I had heard some early blues from my parents' records, but it was mostly like stuff that had gone into universities like Robert Johnson. Like there was a certain group of black artists mm -hmm. that were part of the folk movement. But then there were all these other <laughs> blues, jazz artists that, I don't know, like that wasn't my experience. I didn't hear some of that stuff. I knew Fats Waller. Uh, I'd heard a lot of Fats Waller, a lot of uh, some Louis Armstrong. So, but uh, Danny, Danny was playing early, early stuff, early jazz. Almost like ragtime stuff or? If you listen to Bessie Smith records, it's right in the middle. It's after ragtime because I think ragtime, I think of ragtime as like Scott Joplin. So that's mm -hmm. 1890s basically. Yeah. And then if you think of swing I think of the 1930s as post depression, but then every like there's this period in the in, up through the 20s where even the rhythm is like not absolutely sort of the approach to to how the shuffle feels is sort of like still in between those two spaces. It's not completely laid back yet, but you kind of feel it's starting to lay back. But Billie Holiday's first recording when she was 16 was in the 30s and you can hear that the, the bands the dance bands are now starting to like do that thing where i suppose the great migration is influ in influencing that too right mm -hmm. because you have country blues becoming urbanized and if you listen to bessie smith like ma rainey is really country you don't have a lot of harmonic changes really is sort of in the in a folky world it's mm -hmm. a folk thing but 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 with bessie you've got piano players and guitar players and they're playing all these passing chords and there's like diminished chords and and weird like little changes in tempo and and these verses that never repeat or these sections that never repeat that are quite complicated and i i believe that that's more of like because of the the urban influence where they go to the cities and you're hearing a lot of a lot more different mm -hmm. kinds of music what grabbed you about that music well it's it's harmonically accessible to me like it's a pop you know dance type of music with some some more complexity to it but not to the point where it's ethereal and and atonal yet it hasn't really gone over, crossed over. So for, for me to learn music, to learn chords, because I was so fascinated by hearing, like, you know, some cool song like uh, Across the Universe from the Beatles. Like, I remember thinking, like, how are you supposed to play that on a ukulele? This is really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was my biggest problem was like, well, where's the harmony coming from? I yeah. just don't get it. Well, you know, the key there is you only play the George Harrison songs because he used to write on ukuleles. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, definitely, yeah, Here well, Comes the Sun is like one of the first ones that I was like, yay! Yeah, success. or something. I think he, yeah, he used to he used to use a... Oh, that's beautiful. And then, but and then he would just play... it doesn't sound like that. He would just play it with a capo, right? When he played it on the guitar. So it would be in the same... Yeah. I mean, I'm not that... I wasn't that good a ukulele player either. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Let's get a ukulele out here right now. Not, no, no. Um, I, and I heard you like... Like when you started guitar, you liked Freddie Green. Is that well? Was well, that right? yeah, right. Because he was in the small group with Billie Holiday and those incredible recordings that they made with Teddy Wilson, um, Lester Young, Freddie Green, Philly Joe Jones, maybe on drums and some of those those recordings. Those I think they made like a hundred records. You know. Uh, during those two years, maybe two or three years, 39, 40. Mm -hmm. It was all wartime, too. I wonder if it wasn't like FDR grants that made that happen. <laughs> it was. It, those records yeah. are absolutely, like, they're just so good. We have to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with more from Madeline Peru and John Harrington. We're back with more from Madeline Peru and John Harrington. So tell me then, how how did you and Dan then connect? You heard him, 
Well, he taught me a lot of this music. I heard him and then I didn't, couldn't find him again because apparently he had a car and he would leave town. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the most amazing thing ever. That big Mercedes that would like just barely fit in the walking street where we were Mm -hmm. all hanging out in those days. So whenever he came to town, you knew it because he was parked in front of the cafe. But uh, I didn't see him for a couple of months. I joined another band. I sang with them we actually got a a job singing in a club and apparently i was very badly behaved and i drank because i only had two songs to sing per set so i just sat and drank alcohol the rest of the time and by the end of the night they said i wasn't behaving Mm -hmm. which i can only imagine was just basically everything looked bad (laughs) at the point (laughs) at that age I think it was still only 15 or something. And I had dropped, and, and basically the high school told me, you know, if you ever don't show up anymore, that's it, you're out. So I took the gig and I didn't show up and I just assumed I was out and then I was out. And then I ran out of money from that gig and then there was a rainy day. Well, of course, if you're a street musician, you watch in the weather all the time. And it was a rainy day and there was no one anywhere and I had like, you know, seven francs or something, which was enough for me to buy half a beer, whatever it was I had. I I literally decided at 10 in the morning, well, I'm going to buy a drink with this. So I sat at this bar with this beer and looked out the window and I said, what have I done to myself? And at that moment, I saw Danny across the street, standing under a, a covered walking passageway, just standing there. And I'm just like, in the world. So I was just ran over to him. I said, Danny, you said I could sing in your band. He said, okay, go ahead. You have to audition first. I said, sure, no problem. He said, go ahead. And then I said, I, what, here now? And of course, I couldn't play any of this, these songs on guitar. So I snapped my fingers and I sang Jeepers Creepers right in his face and he stared me down the entire time and it was so <laughs> embarrassing and i just just nervous you know i thought oh this is it you know and then he was so nice he just turned to be he went from like making me dread every minute to just being completely warm and said okay you're in the band but you have to audition for the other guy uh, as well He's our musical director, and he's in Holland, and we're going to go there tomorrow. So come back tomorrow, and I'll, we'll, we'll go to Holland. We're going to go to Holland together. And then I didn't have anywhere to stay that night, so I was really— Was your mother not? My mother had told me if I didn't go to school that I couldn't stay at home anymore. Mm-hmm. I had dropped out of school several times by this point. Right. So we had gotten to a point where she was just like, well, you're not allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> you can't be like this anymore. And she was right. But I got Danny to let me join the band, and I still didn't have any anywhere to stay that night, and I didn't tell him, and I didn't know him. I didn't know if he would have ha- helped me out, but I had this other friend. I went went to the guy and... He said, yeah, okay, you can sleep on my floor tonight. If you're joining Danny's band, it's cool. It's going to be great because he knew Danny. But then the next day, Danny just sat around drinking coffees all day long. And I sat outside the cafe with my guitar just wondering, like, I hope we're leaving today. We (laughs) didn't leave. I had to go back to my friend. He opened the door and he said, what the fuck are you doing back here? Oh, Danny, you know, okay, you can spend another night here. And it's happened three or four times. (laughs) The guy cussed at me. What the fuck? When is Danny going to leave? Then we did leave. I got and I joined the band. Mm-hmm. And and I started learning this music. The musical director, quote unquote, was a wonderful guitar player named Chris Monin, who was actually also a teenager himself. He was uh, studying guitar at the conservatory, the jazz conservatory in Southern Holland. Mm-hmm. So, how long did you play with with Danny's band? I played with Danny's band. I tried to leave his band a couple of times, and then I ended up <laughs> coming back. But, I mean, I think I was about 17, yeah, mm-hmm. 17 when 
when we got to the end of this, we, there was a documentary, this uh, film uh, student was making a documentary about us and he said, come on, you guys need to play in Harlem. And I remember thinking, why on earth would we go and play this play in Harlem? And Danny took it as a challenge, I think. Mm. And so we did. And people threw bottles at us. I said, you better not, you know, set up your amps in front of my house. What are you, crazy? Which, you know, that was crazy. It was a bad idea. Mm. But we ended up finding a place that we could set up. And it was out in the, this court building there on 125th. Mm. Anyway, when the documentary was over, the people that had funded this documentary were suddenly had no money to pay us anything at all. And so everybody had to fall back on their own uh, druthers, and I had nothing to fall back on. So I left the band at that moment because I had absolutely nothing. And I hitchhiked from wherever we were in Denmark back to Paris. So I played in the subway after that mm -hmm. and tried to do, like with my guitar, tried to use some of the stuff I had learned being in the band. And didn't do too too well, but I I learned some dis a little bit of discipline, <laughs> and then uh, Danny would see me. He would I would turn around. This is how Danny was. He was so was such an amazing character because I'd be playing in the subway and everything, and I'd feel somebody staring at me, and I would look and way at the back of the car, he'd be over over in the corner, and he had been following me, just listening to me, mm. trying to see what I was doing. And I just remember, what are you doing, man? But it was so sweet. He actually just, we we were family, and that's just the way it was always going to be, you know, with his potato salads that he'd, he'd make these incredibly huge tubs of food for parties, and he would throw parties on his boat. And I he had, he had kept let me live on his boat for a while when I was in the band, too. He had a boat outside of the Seine. Were you writing at this point, or were you just a... Were you just performing? I wanted to write songs, and Danny told me <laughs> I shouldn't do that. You know, I certainly didn't know what I was doing. I, basically, my, my approach to songwriting was like everything else at that time. It was like, close your eyes and wish, make a wish, and see what happens. And I really don't think I could ever figure out writing until until this record I feel like I had a breakthrough because for the first time I decided before sitting down to finish a project or to write it and say, this is what I'm going to stand by. This is what I believe is the song I want. I, I decided I need to find out what's already there that's not being said and just try and say it. And if I'm not saying it, if it's not clear, then the job's not finished. You, you've written lots of songs in the past. How, how is that different? I suppose in the past, I've always felt like I was looking to discover what the song was, that it was already, that it was somebody else's song. Now it's mine, mm. even though it was, obviously it was still me doing it. But I think that COVID, all, all of the things that matter in the world became so pronounced. And I'm going to borrow Cornell West's verbiage on this, it's the catastrophe that we had to face, just how to how to deal with catastrophe. Now, I didn't suffer any catastrophe during COVID, mm -hmm. but I, I just, as most of my life, I've witnessed it. Okay. Uh, wouldn't you do a song now? What do you want yeah, to do? Yeah, let's play a song. You want to play Find True Love? Um, yeah. This is the opening track right. on the record. Okay. You got it. Just me. <laughs> Beautiful. A little feedback there right at the end. Yeah. Um, so tell me about writing that song. Do you remember how it started? Uh, yeah, John and I remember very clearly because we worked hard, I think. The title and those three words, Find True Love, are, were the hardest part of the whole song, which really? now seems like the, the most obvious choice. But at the time... I was using the phrase, eat, pray, love, mm -hmm. from the book. Right. Did you think that was going to be the song, or were you like, oh, I'll just fix that later? Yeah, I, it, it was yeah. the whole song. I mean, you wrote the whole song using with that. that with that as the title. But we threw lyrics back and forth quite a lot on that. And 
And at some point, we chucked it, you know, because it wasn't working with... Yeah. It wasn't necessarily the right thing. I no, mean, but it was a springboard for you. And, yeah. And so gotta, the idea it, of Eat, way. Pray, Love is very powerful because there are three distinct sounds, three distinct one-syllable words that are actions and nouns and and worlds unto themselves. It's great writing. And I, I read the, the book and everything, but I wanted the meaning of the song to have its own life. And so I think on some level we knew that yeah. it probably wasn't going to survive scrutiny. It was sort of, can you do better than that? And then I was like, well, I'm not as good as, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert on this, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> no, but it's, but sometimes you need that to just to continue working on it, just having any words. You know, the blank sheet of paper is the, is the terrifying thing. When you have anything down, then it's editable, you know? Yeah. And so it wasn't a big jump to go from eat, pray, love it's yeah, just, that was my, it was the so, blank, sl the blank yeah, slate it helps. was. Yeah. One of the obvious word choices that jump out in that song is learn how to die. Just about anybody else would say learn how to fly, learn how to do all these other things, because it's a very joyful song. What brought that on? Well, for me, that's a direct quote from Cornell West, and I'd been listening to Cornell West quite a bit. Now, I don't know who Cornell West might be quoting when he says, in order to learn how to love, you have to learn how to die. But he says it quite a bit in a lot of different contexts. Some of his lectures that he's done and some of his speaking engagements that he's done, but whatever I could find, mostly on YouTube, during that time when for a good couple of years uh, after George Floyd, but even, yeah, even before that, you know, I was just following him because he had a voice. It was a voice of reason on, on television. You know, if, if you needed somebody, if you wanted to hear somebody on television, on the news, speak to you, it, it was slim pickings for me. Like I, I, I felt a direct mirroring of my childhood with my alcoholic father and the violent tyrant tyranny in that world and the escape or rather the survival of that environment as a child at playing music with my mother was like a mirror image for me in 2020 of seeing police brutality and the search for solace, consolation, a path forward using the tools that I still to this day are the to only tools that really I've acquired, which is listening to intuitively to poetry and music and, and being, trying to be part of that tradition. After this last break, we'll be back with the rest of Madeline Peru and John Harrington. We're back with the rest of Bruce Hedlum's conversation with Madeline Peru and John Harrington. You said in the past about how particularly love songs are political. Um, is it because for you it takes you into a kind of a different place in your life? Or it's uh, like being relieved of a feeling of tyranny, a feeling of, of oppression. That's political as well. It's not in not this. Yeah. Not in a cynical, terrible way, in a very That's profound it. way. Yeah. And also just the desire to be heard if you need help to, mm -hmm. or, or, or to feel like you could be heard, you know, if you're going to need help because something is going to come down the pike at you and you're going to need to survive that. And it's just a, a technique that I think a lot of kids of uh, alcoholic parents have, have, are aware of, that they was part of their way of growing up. But I think when I hear somebody like Cornel West turn around and say, we need to talk about uh, justice is what love looks like in public and tenderness is love in private. And it's like, yeah, that's, th these are not, you know, radical ideas. They're loving ideas. They might be radical in a sort of Christian way, but I don't think you have to be Christian because I'm not going to go for it that way. I needed to say the words, the gospel of Jesus in the song, and, and that was an interesting moment because I wanted to talk about the message without the religion. And I'm not sure if that's even possible for some people to grasp. Um, well, I'm interested that what the feeling you get from Cornell West, which is someone saying, 
true, sometimes messy things out loud. Is that, this is a stretch, is that the same feeling you got listening to those great old records you love so much, like Ma Rainey and Billie mm. Holiday? Is it the same kind of truth-telling in a way? Well, it's interesting that you say that a very interesting question because it's definitely still taboo to right now to open the discussion on violence within a relationship, within a romantic relationship. And it can ruin the feminist message that, for example, Billie Holiday or Bessie Smith or Ma Rainey would have when they sing about being get, uh, having a man that mistreats them. Mm -hmm. And how much they still love him. But, you know, that's the point. I mean, love is messy. We are human. Nobody ever says, I'm always right and they're always wrong, unless you're not really looking at finding the truth. Because you've got to listen to one more than one perspective to find the truth. Mm -hmm. you, even if you don't want to agree with it, you have to be aware that it's there. Mm -hmm. Your sort of breakthrough album was Careless Love. There's a reason it's called Careless. Yeah. 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 That was the W.C. Handy song when Bessie Smith uh, recording was the one that influenced me. And then I met Odetta and she was singing it in her own way with her different lyrics and discussing the meaning of that song. And, and we perform it all the time. And it's definitely been 100 years now, I think. Tell me about How I Wish on this record. So How I Wish, I think that's a song that I chiseled at like it felt like like maybe what sculptors do when they see a shape inside of another shape and they remove what's in the way of that and i i think feel like that was my my job especially with the lyrics okay um let me ask you first then what was in the way i had to accept that i wanted to be able to say something to somebody that didn't know me or anything about me or anybody else. I wanted it to be a blank slate starting point, mm -hmm. but a direct conversation. I was, uh, I, a lot of my songs tend to be like that. I'm talking to somebody. Do you always and, have somebody uh, in mind when you're... No, I don't think so. And did you on this one? Just... I'm probably talking to myself. Okay, well, that's fair <laughs> making it Making somebody else suffer the... <laughs> you know, the, the, the conversation, the yeah. monologue. Yeah. Is that one of the ones you wanted to play? Yeah, Very much, can. yeah. Sure. Great song. Okay, please. You may have to upgrade your opinion of your uh, songwriting soon, I think. <laughs> That's uh, a Thank great you. song. <laughs> Thank you. I loved everything you were doing on the low strings on the accompaniment. It's oh, very, uh, <laughs> it was very Freddie Green, I thought, <laughs> using that D string. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, John arranged it with a with a different tuning for the for the record. You did a, yeah, a low, to tune you got the low D one, in there, and could mm -hmm. use it the was low D. <laughs> beautiful arranging. And uh, and I'm glad I'm glad that uh, that it turned out to be a beautiful arrangement because. I remember John telling me, what are you doing? I was like, there's something wrong. There's something missing. Don't change it. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was one that, yeah? that needed very little. Um, and we were, I forget you were working on it for quite here. a while. Well, you were working you were on telling the lyrics me, like, for Stop. quite a while. He was trying to teach me and how to play the song. Well, and, would, and he said, well, you wrote it. I said, no, I didn't do that. You, he would, said, send, yes, you, you would send stuff, <laughs> like, because you were working for quite a long time on a lyric, you would send newer versions, you know, with different lyrics so I could hear them. And, and I would notice would... that, well, well, you should change the melody there or she changed that chord progression. They're like, well, no, what are you doing? I loved what you did early. So, I mean, so I had to sort of keep cracking the whip so you would just not lose what was great about it in the beginning. The first version of this basically had all the music and, you know, melody and chords and mostly the form too. And there's no single version of a song in in any former incarnation that that was just yours alone or just mine alone that was better than the collaboration turned out to be so yeah in, in all cases the collaboration i think helped and i find that's almost always true um we should end there i've got a million other questions uh but i've taken a lot of your time and it's been fabulous thank you so it's been much a real treat 
Thanks again to Madeline Peru and John Harrington for talking about the making of their new album, Let's Walk. You can hear it along with other songs from Madeline on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced and edited by Leah Rose with marketing help from Eric Sandler and Jordan McMillan. Our engineer is Ben Tolliday. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like this show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. <laughs>